And what they found was that even before you factor in flood and drought, simply that temperature increase from this point on should be enough to cut grain yields 10% for each degree that we increase the temperature. So you guys know enough about the world by now to be able to make some predictions about what will happen to stability, to peace, to progress, to development, to women's rights, to all the things that we care about if there are 10 or 20 or 30 percent fewer calories on this earth. Nothing good will happen. We can't let that world be. We've got to prevent it. It is the most important fight that any group of humans have ever engaged in, ever. Not many people get to say at any given moment on this planet, I'm in the most important place I can be doing the most important thing I can be doing, but you guys get to kind of say that today. Okay, you're in a really important place, and now the question is making sure that you're doing enough about it, that you're digging in with enough leverage to make change on the scale we need. Some of that change has to happen on your campuses, okay? We gotta get your campuses carbon neutral and fast. Uh, mm. Middlebury said it'll be carbon neutral by 2016. Hey, Bill! Um, um, Sorry. We need you guys to be matching that kind of stuff all around the country. But, but, even if we could all make that happen really fast on campus, it would not be anywhere near enough because our campuses and our communities are embedded in a larger system that at the moment is not changing. Carbon emissions on this planet went up 5% last year. We just got the new data. Oh. The biggest increase ever recorded. Okay? We are sprinting right now in the wrong direction. And there is a reason that that is happening. And the reason has to do with power. I spent a long time thinking that the way we were going to solve this problem was that we would have scientists explain what was going on to our political leaders and our whatever, and that they would make the shifts that would need to be made. <laughs> In fact, I confess when I wrote The End of Nature, I was 26 or 27, and my theory of change was people will read this book and then they will change. Oh. <laughs> and people did read it. I mean, it came out in 24 languages or something. It was a big bestseller. But that turns out to be not how it works. Oh. While those scientists have been calmly talking to our leaders and explaining what's going on, the fossil fuel industry has been bellowing in the other ear of our political <laughs> leaders and drowning out any of that common sense and reason. Um, they've been instead issuing the kind of series of threats to people's political Whoa. careers that have been sufficient to keep action from happening. You can see it most powerfully on display in the US Senate last summer, not this summer, but the one before, when the Senate, still then dominated by Democrats, refused to even take a vote on the most mild, tame, temperate, tempted, moderate climate legislation you could possibly imagine. They were so scared of the fossil fuel industry that they would not even take a vote. Okay. Hmm. That's the reason that we have to do more than work on our campuses, because it will not be, in the end, enormously useful oh. to have a series of green islands surrounded by a, uh, a, a, a heating uh, planet. Right? We need to do other things too, and the good news is that those other Woo! things are starting to happen, and we're beginning to see them build, and you are capable of making them happen. I'm going to tell a couple of stories yeah. really quickly. One is about the work that I've done with my friends over the last few years to build this thing called 350.org. Okay, when I was talking about Woo! that before, 350, that number is kind of the bottom line of that equation. In January of 2008, our most important climatologist, Jim Hansen at NASA, and his team published a paper saying we now know enough from looking at paleoclimate data 
and real-time observation to say how much carbon is too much. They said any value for carbon in the atmosphere greater than 350 parts per million is not compatible with the planet on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. That is strong language for scientists to use, and it is stronger still when you know that wherever you are today, in Pittsburgh or Peking or wherever, the atmosphere contains 393 parts per million of CO2. They were already way too high. That's why the Arctic is melting and Pakistan is drowning and Texas is burning. Ah! Sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. We're already way too high. And so that paper was incredibly depressing to read. It was a kind of acknowledgement that we weren't going to stop global warming. We were only going to stop it from getting any worse than we absolutely have to. But it was also, for a few of us, a little bit thrilling to read. Because we'd been trying to figure out how we were going to try and build a global climate movement, something that there really has never been. Okay? And one of the reasons that there never has been is because it's hard to organize things on a global scale. It's hard, among other things, because everybody around the planet insists on speaking their own language, which makes it inordinately difficult to talk amongst ourselves. It's hard for even if you have all the money in the world to organize like that. You know, Coca-Cola, um, which does have a lot of um, Sorry. Um, their current slogan is, Coke is it. Okay. The phrase with literally no meaning. And then the reason that that's their slogan is because their own slogan was, there might be people old enough to remember, just a few of us in here, when their slogan was, Coke adds life. Okay. Which is, means a little more, not a lot, but a little. Um, the trouble was, when they put on billboards all around the world, in many places their slogan apparently became, Coke will bring your ancestors back from the dead. <laughs> This was not an effective advertising strategy. <laughs> so, Coke is it, right? That's as we're going to get. We looked at that 350 number, and we said, huh, you wouldn't normally organize a campaign around a wonky scientific data point. <laughs> However, Arabic numerals do cross linguistic boundaries. Maybe this is our way in. 350 means same thing no matter where you are. It was good we had that one advantage, because we had really no others. We had no money, and it was me and seven undergraduates. <laughs> they were seniors. So I drink that one. Sorry. They weren't done with school, but they were done with school, more or less. Um, and uh, seven actually was the right number, because there are seven continents, so each one of them took one. Um, and we went to work. The guy who had the Antarctic also had to take the internet, because it's sort of its own. <laughs> Oh no! And off we went. And our job was to find people like ourselves around the world and try to get them involved and interested. Uh, uh, and most parts of the world, that's not, you know, there's not like a category called environmentalists, but it's people working on women's issues and on food security and on war and peace and on social justice and on development, on all the things you can't do on a cratering planet, okay? And we didn't, we, we did training camps with young people in Turkey for Central Asia and in the Caribbean and in Johannesburg. I remember we brought down from pretty much every country in Africa one or two young people. You know, most had never even left their countries before, but they were born organizers and they were great. And we, we, everybody was fanned out across the planet. We knew they were working, but we didn't know, you know, all volunteers, all just, you know, we, we didn't know. White House all going to add up. And so we're going to take one day, October 24th, 2009, so not quite two years ago. Um, we're going to take that, we're going to make it a kind of coming out party for this number and try to drive it into the middle of the information bloodstream, you know? Hey! And everybody has to figure out something they're going to do in their place to make this happen. We get the first sense that it might actually kind of work. Two days early on October 22nd, the eight of us were sitting around a borrowed office in Lower Manhattan, just crowded into one room with our laptops open, writing press releases and things. 